morning, April 12, 1861. The first Confederate shots fell on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Through 34 hours of bombardment, no help came. The flag was lowered. The nation was torn by civil war. As the four tragic years began, most elements of military strength favored the North, whose agriculture and industrial potentials were enormous, with a good rail system, many large ports, a strong merchant marine. The agricultural South had an inadequate industry and rail system, a few important ports, a few merchant ships. The Northern population was about 22 million. Of the South's nine million, over one-third were slaves. Neither side had large armies. The Northern Navy of 90 ships included 42 in active service. The South was without a single ship of war. At first, Northern war plans were simple and direct. President Lincoln ordered the Navy to blockade the entire Southern coast. An army of 90-day volunteers would move South, capture Richmond, and restore the Union. The Battle of Bull Run shattered this illusion. So a new strategy took form, based on long-range objectives. In its broadest sense, the plan was surround the South on sea and land, press in on all sides, split the South into two parts. Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells, Assistant Secretary Gustavus Fox, and a special board of strategy shaped the Navy's mission. Control of the sea belonged to the North, and to exploit it fully, three basic decisions were made. First, strengthen the blockade. Second, reduce land strongholds on coasts and rivers. Third, support the armies with firepower, transport, and supply. A vastly expanded Navy would be required to carry out these diverse duties. The North had the yards to build the ships and could call on a large body of experienced officers and a population with a long seafaring history. The Confederate Secretary of the Navy, Stephen Mallory, faced a far more difficult problem. He had a corps of trained officers who had resigned their commissions in the Federal Navy, but he had no Navy. He could not match the growing number of Northern ships. He needed vessels fast enough to elude the blockade or raid northern shipping, or powerful enough to fight against great odds. Men with little or no nautical background had to be recruited and trained. New weapons must be devised. Commander Matthew Fontaine Maury and others developed ingenious mine-like torpedoes, some to be fired electrically. Kegs filled with high explosives designed to explode on contact and spar torpedoes mounted on small craft and detonated on impact. But it would take time to produce any of these devices. Thus, lack of naval strength played a dominant role in compelling the Confederacy to accept a defensive strategy. It was hoped that heavy manpower losses in the land action would weaken the North's will to fight and gain time to secure European recognition, material assistance, perhaps even active intervention if the federal naval blockade cut off the flow of cotton to England and the continent. When President Lincoln ordered the blockade, the number of available ships was inadequate for controlling some 3,500 miles of southern coastline. Still, the threat was sufficient to damage Confederate commerce overnight. Privateering was authorized, and soon ships were slipping through the blockade to raid northern commerce and bring back much needed supplies. The North Carolina sounds were privateer havens, so in August 1861, a federal fleet appeared off Hatteras Inlet, bombarded the two defending forts into submission, and sealed off Pamlico Sound. Six months later, the capture of Roanoke Island neutralized Albemarle Sound. By now, the South was using fast blockade runners built abroad. These paddle wheel steamers made about 14 knots and were capable of eluding the blockading ships. To counter the blockade runners, it was imperative that northern ships remain on station for longer periods. 
For this purpose, seizure of a base on the Confederate coast was essential. Port Royal Sound, near the main southern coastal ports, was the objective. On 7 November 1861, a large Army-Navy amphibious expedition with Flag Officer Samuel F. DuPont in command of naval forces captured Port Royal after a short but severe engagement with the defending forts. A permanent base was gained, and the bulk of southern coastal defenses were withdrawn out of range of naval attack. So DuPont had little opposition while occupying all strategic points from Savannah to Cape Canaveral. When war started, federal efforts to destroy the naval facilities at Norfolk were only partially successful. And the Confederates captured more than 1,000 cannon, an invaluable dry dock, and 11 partially damaged ships, including the steam frigate Merrimack. The Southerners raised the Merrimack, sheathed her with iron, and installed a ram. Her overall length was 275 feet, with only the armored casemate above water. She mounted 10 heavy guns, firing cast iron shells. Rechristened the Virginia, and under command of Flag Officer Franklin Buchanan, who had been the first superintendent of the U.S. Naval Academy, she went into action 8 March 1862. Steaming slowly toward the Federal fleet at Hampton Roads, she opened fire on the sloop Cumberland lying at anchor. The Cumberland shot bounced off the sloping sides of the ironclad. The cannonade lasted for 15 minutes. Then, the Virginia rammed with great force. And within minutes, the waters closed over all but the masts and flag of the Cumberland. The Virginia now turned on the frigate Congress, which was frantically maneuvering for a more favorable position. She, too, was battered into submission. By now, the Virginia had lost the use of her ram and two guns. Her commander was wounded. She broke off the action. Here was a deadly challenge to the blockade. In fact, to the very existence of the Navy. But at this moment, wallowing in heavy seas off the coast, a curious-looking Union ship was steaming south to meet the threat of the Virginia. She was the Monitor, built and ready in 131 days after the plans of John Erickson. She measured 173 feet, covered with a one-inch sheet of armor. A chief feature was a heavily armored revolving turret, nine feet high, mounting two 11-inch Dahlgren guns firing 168-pound shot. This turret allowed the guns to be trained through 360 degrees. Several hours after the destruction of the Cumberland and Congress, the Monitor arrived at Hampton Roads, and her commander, Lieutenant John Warden, prepared for battle. Next morning, the Virginia, now commanded by Lieutenant Catesby Jones, advancing to renew the attack on the blockading ships, was met instead by the Monitor's fire. There followed a momentous engagement lasting more than three hours, fought mostly at close range. For the first time, two ironclads were locked in combat. A new era of war at sea dawned. The Monitor fired every seven or eight minutes. Most of the shot hit the Virginia, but with little effect. The Confederate guns poured out a more rapid fire, but only a few shells hit the Monitor, doing little harm. The Virginia struck her antagonist a glancing blow. Earlier loss of her ram prevented serious damage. A shell struck the Monitor's pilot house, temporarily blinding Lieutenant Warden. No one had been killed, and but few wounded. Yet the Virginia's attack on the Federal Squadron and her duel with the Monitor dramatized the fact that wooden navies were obsolete. Thereafter, both sides concentrated on the construction of armored vessels.